Okay, so here we go with Edexcel uh, GCSE A2 Physics Unit 4 Physics on the Move for January 2013. Uh, section A is a multiple choice section, but because this is largely a synoptic paper, it's important to remember that if you blast through these 10 questions, uh, having to pick up all these different topics, then the likelihood of you making a mistake somewhere increases. So uh, several years ago the examiner's report recommended that people did not tackle this first but uh, I would sort of recommend to students that they looked at the main questions in section B and whatever that topic was when they you know if they had say electromagnetism question when they'd done that in section B they come back and look here in the multiple choice for any similar kind of question, any, anything from the same topic, and do that then. When you get to the end of the paper, come back here, and if there are any questions that haven't been picked up yet, then you can finish and answer them then. Okay, so the suggestion is that you don't try and blast through the multiple choice in a big hurry, uh, that you come back to them later when you've got a feel for the particular topic that they're in. Okay, in the meantime, we'll rush in where fools uh, often do and have a go at these. Question one there is just straight book work, just straight out of your notes. Magnetic flux is the Weber. Okay, nice and straightforward. B then. A body initially in rest explodes into two masses, M1 and M2. These masses move apart with speeds V1 and V2 respectively. The ratio of V1 over V2 is equal to one of these things. So we just identify important words that appear here. Uh, and the fact that the object is initially at rest means that the total momentum before was nothing. The total momentum after equals nothing. Therefore, M1 V1 has to have the same size as M2 V2. So we say that M1 V1 equals M2 V2, and I'm just ignoring the fact that uh, they're equal and opposite, so I'm not putting a minus sign in. It's not needed for this kind of problem. Uh, and that means that if we rearrange this for V1 over V2, that that will be equal to M2 over M1, just collecting terms on either side of the equal sign there. So that means the answer is B. Okay, question three. Which of the following is a property of a uniform electric field? A field that doesn't change over time, a field that acts equally in all directions, a field that only produces a force on moving charged particles, and a field that has the same strength at all points. Well, again, this is just book work. A field that has the same strength at all points is what a uniform electric field is. Question 4. A potential difference of 50 volts is applied between two identical parallel aluminium plates. The plates are separated by a distance of 10 millimetres. Which combination of potential difference and separation would double the electric field strength? So what you need to do here is find out what the original electric field strength is. So we get electric field with parallel plates like this by doing uh, E equals V over D. So if we do that, we've got 50 over 10. So that gives us an E strength of like 5 volts per millimeter. So it says we're interested here in something that would double the electric field strength. So we're looking for a combination in amongst these results here that gives us 10 volts per millimeter. So uh, 100 over 20, that's going to give us 5 again. 25 over 20 is like 1 and a quarter. 100 over 10 is going to give us the value we're looking for. And again, this is value here is 2.5. So the correct answer here is C.
Right, question 5 then. Which of the following is not a vector quantity? Okay, so electric field strength, well, it's the direction. It always has a direction based on the way a positive charge would be pushed. Magnetic flux density, well, it has a, a direction based on the way a north pole would be pushed. Uh, momentum has a direction based on the velocity and uh, potential difference is the closest thing to a non-vector. Many of you would probably argue that potential difference, there is a direction to it, therefore you're wondering what's going on here. But anyway, the answer is D. Question 6. Two identical spheres of mass m are both travelling with a speed v towards each other. The spheres collide head-on. Which of the following statements must be true after the collision? Must be true. Must has been uh, emphasised for us. So we need to think about not things that can be true, but things that must be true. Now, if we recognise the fact that momentum is a vector, then we will realise that uh, the first answer of 2mv can't be true because these momentum values are equal and opposite. Total momentum equal to naught will be true because total momentum before the collision was zero. Okay. Total kinetic energy, well, it can have any kind of value um, because there was kinetic energy before. So there's no specific reason to pick that. Total kinetic energy equal to zero is possible. It's a possible outcome. But these uh, two spheres, if they stop dead, will have total momentum equal to nothing and total kinetic energy equal to nothing. But if they bounce off each other and, and go back the way they came, then they will still have total momentum equal to nothing, uh, but the total kinetic energy will have a value. So the answer is B. Question 7. A cyclist travels along a straight horizontal road at a steady speed. A net force of 20 newtons is then applied for 6 seconds. The change of momentum of this cyclist is going to be one of these values. So we remember that Newton told us that the uh, change of momentum, mv minus mu, is equal to the impulse given ft. So we have here a force and a time given in the question. So 20 times 6 is uh, 120 kilogram meter per second. And so that's answer C. So we're saying here the change of momentum has the same value as the impulse. So we find the change of momentum here by looking at the value of the F times T. Question 8 then, a conductor of length 50 millimetres carries a current of 3 amps at 30 degrees to a magnetic field of flux density 0.4 Tesla. The magnitude of the magnetic force acting on the conductor is one of these values. So the force here is equal to B I L sine of theta, where theta is the angle between the conductor and the field. So that's 0 0.4 times 3 amps times 50 times 10 to the minus 3, because it's in millimeters, times the sine of 30 degrees. And that comes out to be 0 0.03 newtons, which means answer A must be correct. Question 9. An alpha particle and a beta particle both move into the same uniform magnetic field, which is perpendicular to the direction of motion. The beta particle travels at 15 times the speed of the alpha particle. The ratio of the force on the beta particle to the force 
on the alpha particle is one of these values. So we just remember that alpha particles are double positive because they've got two protons in them and beta particles are single negative. So the Q is like two electrons worth up here and just one electron worth here. So the force on a charged particle in a magnetic field is B Q V uh, magnetic field times charge times the velocity and we remember that according to this the beta has uh, 15 times the speed of the alpha particle so if the alpha particle has uh, velocity v then the velocity here is 15 v okay so they want the ratio of the beta to the alpha so f beta over f alpha would be B charge of the beta is just 1 E and its velocity is 15 V and on the bottom we have B and uh, times 2 E Oh goodness me, this pen's not working. Times an 1v. Okay, so let's go through that again. Uh, we same magnetic field, B and B on both sides, times a single electron for the beta particle, times 15v for the velocity. And in the bottom line, same magnetic field, 2e for the charge, and 1v for the velocity. So the top line is going to simplify to 15 EV and the bottom line is 2 EV. So because the B's will cancel, these B's will just cancel out and the E's will cancel out and you get the V's cancelling out and you get 15 over 2 which is 7.5. Okay, question 10. The tubes of a linear accelerator, LINAC, get progressively longer down its length because of one of these things. A. The accelerating particles become relativistic. B. The frequency of the applied voltage potential difference sorry, changes. C. The accelerating particles must spend the same time in each tube. And D. The accelerating particles gain mass. Okay, so it's not to do with becoming relativistic. It's to do with being able to use the same alternating frequency. And that means they have to stay in the tubes for the same amount of time to make that work. So we can use the same frequency if the tubes get compensatory increases so that the tube length uh, creates a, a similar time. Even though there's a higher speed, the time in each tube is the same because we've made them longer. That allows us to use a steady frequency to operate a LINAC. So the answer is C.